I think one of the spectacular things that happens in the miracles of Jesus is in the instances where Jesus does it completely off the wall. We grow to expect Jesus touching people. We watch him do that a lot. He touches a leper. He touches a lame man. He touches a blind man. And they receive their, they can walk. They receive their hearing. They receive their sight. It's the odd moments where things don't go exactly that way in which the Bible's not trying to show us that Jesus failed or that Jesus wasn't really a good Jesus that day. You know, he was half a Jesus that day because one time he touches a man's eyes and, and he says, can you see? And the guy goes, I can see trees walking. And so Jesus touches his eyes again and goes, what about now? The guy goes, I can see all things clearly. And maybe we walk away and go, well, sometimes he had an off day. I mean, you know, he didn't get his second cup of coffee. He had to warm up. The first was a warm up miracle. And then he had to, no, no, that, that, of course we know better than that. So why do those happen? Because sometimes the Bible's trying to teach us something that's a little harder to see on the surface. I think that's what happens in the blind man, the man born blind. When, whenever Jesus spits on the ground and makes a mud pie and puts paste on the eyes of the man born blind and then doesn't finish the healing. Instead, he says to the man, now go wash in the pool of Siloam, which by the way, you've got to walk all the way over there to the pool of Siloam. And yes, I know you're blind. How are you going to find the pool of Siloam? Figure it out. You've probably been there a lot in your lifetime, but get to the pool, splash water on your eyes. Let that be the extension of your faith, the fulfillment of your faith. Watch what happens after you do that. So we know the story. He goes to Salome, splashes water on his face, and he can see, and he's never been able to see before. And I, I read that for so long ago. Why didn't Jesus just say, boom, you're healed. This is easy. Uh, healing people is my thing. I can just snap my fingers and you can see. Because sometimes it's not about God getting us immediately to the answer. It's about God engaging us in the process that gets us to the answer. And so this is why I believe like right now in this, in this COVID-19, I personally don't believe that God's, God on the earth is going to move in and snatch it up and take it away. Because I believe that for the health and security of the future of the planet, God is going to bless someone to go to Salome and figure out how to wash the eye solve off the eyes until there's healing. In other words, somebody's wrestling with something bigger than themselves and are going to go do what needs to be done because God has always put a challenge in the heart of man to rise above his circumstances and go figure things out. Sometimes we're praying for the miraculous. What we ought to be praying for is wisdom. So we'll say, God, well, I wish you'd come in here and do this. And God says, I'm not going to do that. Why not, God? Don't you love me? No, because I've put inside of you the ability to do it. You're just going to have to figure that out. I'll help you figure it out. You and I will wrestle over it together. I'll speak to your heart. I'll bless your, your, what your hand touches. I'll be with you when it gets hard. I won't let the enemy destroy you. That's my end of the deal. Your end of the deal is answer those hard questions. Ask some back in return. Wrestle with these concepts and allow the Holy Spirit to do what He's going to do in you so you can do what you were born to do on the earth. And, and that's a part of that role and that responsibility that we have. So I want to take you to Genesis 3. You know the story about how Adam and Eve have eaten from the fruit. I don't think it's an apple. Apples aren't cursed in the <laughs> garden. I know it makes for really nice artwork for it to be a red shiny apple that Eve eats. If they need it to be that way, fine. It looks like a red shiny apple, but she eats the tree that was good for food, and we know the Bible says it was pleasant for the eyes. But look in verse 7. The eyes of them both were opened. Genesis 3. The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. I want you to notice that in verse 7, when they eat the fruit, they don't become naked. They were already naked. So it's not as if by sinning they were demoted to a different state. They were already naked before. And I know what we've imagined is a lot of times is we imagine they had this big ball of light around them. That's how the artwork always does it. I don't know if it's because in Christian artwork, you know, we didn't want to show naked people standing outside. So, but, you know, so we go pre-fall and put a big ball of light around them so we can clean it up for the Sunday school class. You know, we don't want to be showing that. So we show them before the fall. And they always got that ball like in a glorified state. I guess in glorified states, you just shine. You know, that, that was kind of our idea. No need for clothing or any of that stuff in glorified states. The, the point of the story has nothing to do with clothes. 
by the way. It, ha it has to do with self-awareness. God made them what they are. He made them as a part of his heart. He fashioned them together. He fashions one out of the dirt, pulls the other out of the side. They have the spirit characteristics and qualities of their heavenly father. They are what he says they are. And they're supposed to live by faith on what he said they are. Here's what you get to do. Here's what's yours. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. But when they eat from the tree, they go into a state of self-awareness and self-consciousness whereby having always been naked, now they realize they are naked. So they begin to determine what they think of themselves based upon external circumstances rather than an internal identity. All they knew before was who they were, not what they were wearing or not wearing. In other words, they had an invisible awareness more than a visible awareness. How many of you realize that the new covenant is trying to take you back to an invisible awareness over a visible awareness? It's why Paul says to the Corinthians, it is not about the tangible or the natural. It's not about what I can see, but what I can't see. That's what Paul says. So it's not just about this temporal eternal. It's something far greater. It's not just what I look like, what I sound like. It's who I know that I am on the inside. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I ask you this, does God make his appointment, the appointment that he had every day with Adam and Eve, does God make his appointment after they fall? And of course the answer is yes. And who hides? It's Adam and Eve who hide from God because that becomes the theme of the Bible is that once you become externally aware of actions rather than internally aware of identity, you'll run from a God whom you think is in the business of judging actions over identity. And so man has separated himself from God. Any separation that man feels from God is a perception. Man is the one that took the step back. God will always make his appointment with man. Yeah. He makes an appointment. You and I are going to walk in the cool of the day. God didn't tell Adam, we'll walk in the cool of the day if you do everything right. He walks in the cool of the day with him anyhow. Yeah. And, and God is not running from anyone you know. God is not offended by anyone you know. God is not turned off by anyone that you know. Even when you're offended by them, or even when you're turned off by them, or even when you refuse to meet with them, God shows up in the cool of the day. Why? Because he has never avoided you based on external circumstances like what you're doing, what you're saying, what you're wearing, whether you're doing this, whether you're not doing that. If that was the nature of God, Genesis would have opened with an offended God avoiding a fallen man. Because God would have been setting a precedent. Yes. You mess up, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. Now I'll come down there and save you, but you're on your own. Genesis doesn't do that. And one of the most underpreached aspects of the Genesis story is the Bible does not kick off with, and we've, we've preached it this way for some reason, is, is that man is like booted out and then God's sort of chasing him down for the rest of the Bible. And then when he can't really catch him, he becomes a man and dies as a man. And the reality is, is that God, God has always been right there with man all the way through the Bible. It's been God alongside holding hands with the family of man. Any separation is not literal. Any separation is in your mind. The Apostle Paul said we have been enemies. We were enemies of God in our own minds. We were enemies in our own minds. Guess what he said in Romans 5.8? God displayed his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, when we were his enemies, he died for us. When we were his enemy, he died for us. I didn't think he had enemies. He doesn't. We be made ourselves enemies in our own minds. When we were still believing that we had done too much and were too far away, he became a man and died on our behalf. And so the book of Genesis is laying that out. It's getting us set up for that moment.